to make something different about the Tenth Amendment. It's called exchanges. And in the exchange, what is required for states is that they must put man money and manpower into a co-op that takes away the autonomy of state lines. You will be put in with California, New Mexico, and Colorado, three of the most liberal states in the Western United States. And you've got to put money into that without having the say of the people that the Tenth Amendment gave you criteria over, which is the health services. That's where you're going to have a problem. That's the one where you can make an attack. But you can't do it just on one area. You have to use all the legislative aspects. The legislative, judicial, and executive arms at the local, the state, and the federal law, and 50 states. Once again, what did I tell you? The weakness of the federal government is when you attack it all the way around. That's our health care. Let me ask you another question. Was this an insurance bill? No. no. You're exactly right. Because what happened is that there was a phone book, that insurance company's got one-tenth of the phone book right now. And now they're mandated to have the whole phone book. And they're going to make a ton of money. Because there's something missing in that. If we're all dentists, let's just say this row, this row right here are dentists. Can any of us start talking about fee schedules and all those kind of things? It's called monopoly and collusion. Okay, we can't. But insurance companies do. It goes all the way to Medicaid Medicare. And you're looking at the guy who's been fighting this. It's an act called the McCarran-Ferguson Act. Let me give you a little history about it. In the middle 1940s, there was a Supreme Court ruling that basically said the federal government could exercise into the monopoly and collusion of insurance companies. Because remember, health and insurance were states. That was given directly to the states. The problem was that they're getting big, okay, and no one could manage them. Well, what happened is that the, the Supreme Court said that the federal government could intercede in that. The insurance companies quickly ran to the Congress and in two weeks produced a bill that went flying through the Congress saying, the federal government can't touch us. That's good and all. We had three states that tried to challenge it, and there are three requirements to challenge that ruling. You must, first of all, have it clear in your constitution. Number two, you must have money and the manpower to actually go at it. Two of the three states I'll mention are the biggest. New York, California, and the other one is South Carolina, who has the clearest definition to take it on in their constitution. How many of those, how many of those succeeded? Zip. Didn't even get past the court. Didn't even, even, didn't even break a sweat. So in this insurance aspect, it's an onion. Think of an onion. You can't get to the real core of the onion until you slowly peel out the outside area. I also have to tell you that I believe in the free marketplace. I want to see insurance companies succeed. Different question there. I want them to do it on their own. I want them to compete against themselves where they can't share the information. And that's all this exclusion is. It's a simple bill. I helped push it. You even got it through the House, 406 to 19. So it can't happen. And Dennis can't talk to attorneys, by the way. So what that basically does is it says, insurance A, insurance B, and insurance C can't talk to each other about what they pay individual doctors, how they talk to you, the patient, and make sure that they compete against each other. And the only one holding that ground is the federal government saying, no, 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 can't go through there. This is where you want government to help you. They were there to level the playing field. And insurance is growing to our forefathers that never expected. They're multinational. They're huge. The next thing I want to tell you is somebody brought up a question that says, insurance companies only make 1% to 3% profit margin. Who believes that in this room? No. Well, it's true, but not. Who's business people in here? You can give me the numbers. We can figure out anything we want to out of those numbers, right? How many board members on insurance companies are worth $400 million? I want that job. I think all of us want that job, right? Yeah. Okay? That's the whole key is we manipulate those numbers to say whatever we want to. So we have to be better at looking at how we decipher and break down the insurance companies and what their profit loss is. I want them to compete. Does this affect us? It affects every single one of us. Because the government has used insurance companies as a middleman to reimburse docs and reimburse you. Medicare and Medicare. All of them have the same underwriting. They know exactly what they're paying each of their docs. 
And the number one reason we don't have family docs up here? They can't make. They got money, no more money coming in. It keeps going down, 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 down. Go ask your family doc. And you know what? There's another problem. If you're a patient on Medicare and the patient says, I want to give you cash out of my pocket to see you, is that legit? No. It isn't. Because if they're caught, they lose privileges and are fined heavily. And it's not just for a couple days, it's for years. Now, why is a dentist telling you that? Why isn't your physician friends telling you that? Because dentistry and medicine are part of company in Medicaid, Medicare. And you can be proud of Arizona for saying so. They were going to these same meetings that the physicians were. But people got upset in, in Arizona saying, you know what, don't trust this. Kind of going down a chute you don't ever come back out of. And they didn't. And dentistry didn't become part of Medicaid, Medicare. They still help with Medicaid, but there's really no tie-in with Medicare. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. Because I sat on the Council of Government Affairs for the American Dental Association, and the tie-in, they're dragging dentistry in. So let's go back to that part I told you about dentistry gave something in this health care bill. Something I've been fighting. It's actually the first doctor, non-doctor, to do surgical procedures. Came in Alaska. The U.S. Public Health Service used the Native Americans to do that. It's called a dental health aid therapist. It was brought in by New Zealand. New Zealand uses them. They don't use them, what we're using them now here. But it's surgical procedures done by a non-doctor. First procedure ever. And guess what? It's even worse. The Native Americans in Alaska are not like our Native Americans here, except for maybe 1%. One, 1%. They're corporations, folks. They sold their sovereignty for corporations. What happens when you give an exemption to one corporation? They all did. They all did. <laughs> and guess what? In the state of Alaska, those corporations are not accountable to the state law or boards. Deja vu. Boy, I've been fighting that like you can't believe. I've taught myself Native American law. And i got to tell you, I know less today than I know back then. But that's what they used. And guess what in the health care bill, in the Senate bill? Who was the clown who brought it in? None other than your comedian friend from, Sen from the Senate of... Senator from Minnesota. Al Franken. Al Franken. Oh. And by the way, I have some friends on the public health service that don't agree with that, so I saw all the dialogue. Okay? I'm a person that believes that those decisions are best made between your, you, and the doctor. You and that health care provider, not the government. This is going to be a hard one to, to really take apart. The thing is, we've got the challenges because right now what they're doing is they're building because it's not in effect yet. <coughs> You're not going to see the benefits. So you better know somebody who understands this law and how to break it up. It's not by complexity, it's by simplicity. <laughs> it's challenging it on smaller pieces all the way through. But it's personal accountability, personal responsibility. I really want to see what America can come up with. We need reform. I'm a dentist telling you that. I have sat on no panels for a reason, because I didn't think it was fair that I talk out of both sides of my mouth. And I have patients in the audience that will test that. I can tell you I've taken the brunt of it to make sure that we had insurance reform. And I tell you, it's harder than hell to make up. I've actually gone to the point where my patients, I'll trade them. If you got a load of dirt, what's your load of dirt with? Everybody knows me. I love a tractor. Give me a tractor. I love playing in the dirt. I'm just a grown-up boy. Only difference between men and boys is the price of their toys. But that's what I've looked at. The problem is, it comes with tax day. There's a reckoning that comes with that. And I can sit down and itemize out all you want, okay? And we had a nice discussion in Payson about that. So have I tried it? I've walked the walk and I talked the talk. So let's go on to the second part. Tell me if their your paycheck is bigger today than it was a year ago. <laughs> Mine's not. I signed on both sides of a paycheck and I watched those dwindle. Problem with District 1 in this district is for small business. There's a few big businesses, but we're all small. 
And you know what? The mountains. And surely the Navajo Nation. I have business people coming up to me and saying, Doc, you know your overhead is 60 to 70 percent. How are you keeping in business? This administration does not like small business. This administration understands that what was the workhorse of America is a small business person. They're building a government. Who's going to fund it? I understand those things. It's not about creating jobs right now, it's about saving jobs. And I don't know what kind of malarkey you guys believe in, but no one's taken into the trends of late, summer, or late spring, early summer, and the natural trends of employment in this country. What's going to happen in the fourth quarter and the first quarter of fourth, fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year? It's that same tale. Because it's not permanent jobs, they're small jobs, they're intermittent jobs. Those are these are not full time jobs, folks. When they start laying off census workers. What's that? When they start laying off these census workers in There you go. There you go. And where did that stimulus money go? There? It was all it was all government. So what we've got to do, and, and, and here's the next thing, just, just so you know. I sold my practice last Tuesday to a kid from here in Flagstaff, and I'm proud of that. Because I brought somebody home that wanted to be home, and that's something that we have to do with family. If you wonder why I know so much about banking, did we get that bank loan for that kid here in this state? No. Do you think we were going to get it in this, in this, in this state? No. Do you think we could have got it anywhere else in the country? Absolutely no. Guess how we got it? Through a benefit through the American Dental Association. What did Thomas Jefferson tell us about his biggest worry, and he argued incessantly about it, was government take over the banks. You darn right. And, and let me ask you about the charade with Goldman Sachs. Is anybody behind that charade? Let me, let me give you some information. Was Goldman Sachs ever offered less than a dollar for dollar buyout? No. How absurd. Was any other bank given the same thing? No. In fact, the SIP group, which was a small business bank, were they even allowed to offer shares? No. That's a shame. <coughs> shame. You know, we have to start looking at things from a historical viewpoint. And there's countless people that have said, if you're not a disciple and understand and look and review history, you become a product of history. It repeats itself. Here we go again. Tell me what was different between this era and Teddy Roosevelt. A central bank was stamped. And many of the moves that happened during that time, most people credit for him putting off the Great Depression. We've got to come with some more innovation. So what do we got to do? Small business, business is what? Leveraging money, right? That's, that's what it is. So where's the money going to come from? Private sector. How do we do it? You have to cut taxes for one thing. You Good. Know, well, first we've got to start printing money. And you have to cut the regulations <laughs> before people can operate. You have to get out of their way and let them operate your business. You're exactly right. But we also got to do something else. We have to create wealth rather than consuming it. There you go. I like where you're going. You have to create wealth you know, through productivity and manufacturing and all that kind of thing. But what we got to do is, i got to get a buy-in to America. Let me ask you a couple things. How long ago did the old money in America go off the playing field? Well, not really. But they're still old money, and, but they left it five years ago. They've not been playing in the playing field. Why do they want to come back in? This administration is devaluing the dollar and their assets. Okay, here's the free marketplace. When a bank gives me a loan, do they watch over me? Do they make me succeed? No. But if I give you money, I'm going to make sure I'm going to succeed. I say, hey, Gus, what are you doing? Tell me what's your, what's your profit loss. Tell me how you're doing this. What's your, all those things. I get something that I can't buy from a bank. So I need a directional incentive. Small business and infrastructure. And I want America to invest in itself. And everything's on the plate. I said infrastructure. I mean roads, bridges, infrastructure. 
Let's step back in time. Remember when the, the, the bridge went down in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota? And they said, how many bridges in the country were usable? How many of those actually got done? Actually, 5%. Okay? My brother-in-law is one of the foremost engineers in the country for dams and bridges. Okay? Well, holy cow, we're running around on infrastructure that shouldn't even tolerate us. Boy, I think it'd be time to see what we could do, you know, private sector-wise in an infrastructure area. I want to take that chance. I want to see what people can do. Because that's how we build. Tell me about our steel industry. It's non-existent. Okay? We got, we, got, we got construction people. We got everything here. We can put it to work. And small businesses, that's how we start getting it to work. Lean and me. Get it to go. And you know what's even better about that? Is District 1. How can we do this? Agriculture. Someone's going to say, you're hiring a guy. Oh, wait. Okay? Energy and resources. Let's talk about agriculture. What does District 1 have in agriculture? Everything. Citrus. We have all the fruits and vegetables. We've got cotton down the south. We've got pork. We've got chickens. We've got beef. We've got water. Holy cow, we got a lot here. What about lumber? we got lumber, too. But it's, it's locked up. Yeah. Well, but those are things we've got to start looking at deregulating. We've got to start right. looking at this. But do you know that in 2008, in the Farm Bill, there was actually a passage that 16 states or entities could actually do their own food stamps. They had to do it for five years. Let me ask you a quick question. What is on the WIC diet, women, infants, and children, that everybody shouldn't be on? Maybe the fruit juices. Okay? I can take that. There is nothing. You, if, you're, if I'm asking you to tighten your belt, then the federal government should also tighten its belt. And the bureaucracy. Can you trade WIC dollars like you can uh, food stamps? Absolutely not. And guess what the number one class in schools are today? Cooking. Here's a sign. All of a sudden, we get to teach kids about what's good for you, how it should be, and how you get involved with your body. Personal accountability, personal responsibility, and they're dying to learn. Here's your sign. That's a good little avenue to start here. Boy. I thought first things first in Arizona was a great way to start. That's one right there. And we got the whole country to show it. Number two is energy. We're blessed. I'm, my energy ideas is that everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. But let's make it work for us. Okay? Because I also believe in alternative energy. I built my house. I'm the first guy out in Coconino County who took all the styrofoam blocks, by the way. You know what? If you look at my house, it looks like a regular log and rock house. It's very energy efficient. It seems very cool in the summer and very warm in the winter. So you don't know any different. We can teach construction, because I put myself through construction, through school with construction. I built big long mansions, and in the times when things were bad in Wyoming, we did add-ons and energy efficiencies and all that kind of stuff. So we can work that's best done on the community level. Solar may not be good somewhere else in the state. It's great here. Wind. All these things need to be there. It does work. Holy cow, today we way too much. This is the first time I've ever had a gust when I was driving down to Camp Verde for a meeting. And I started in one lane and I ended up halfway in the other lane. And I got a little scared. You know? And if you've been, ever been in Wyoming between Laramie and, and Cheyenne, okay, it took some doing there. But, and you got another thing. It's called the Native Americans. I want to spend a little time right there with Native Americans. Something happened with Native Americans. They get the same benefits that you and I do. And this applies to health and to energy. But they also get another thing through the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So they get another tributary. In that aspect, they actually challenged the federal courts about self-determination. And the courts have held it. In the past, they had to do their contracts in health with Indian Health Services. Now they don't have to. They can actually take the money allotted to them by tribal numbers and do whatever they'd like to. There's a few strings. But not like the rest of the strings the rest of us show. I actually believe that they have the salvation for our health care. 
They can actually have the state-of-the-art hospitals, physicians from all over the world, a native. You are better off in Flagstaff than the people in Pinal County and Prescott, Prescott Valley and the White Mountains, and surely the Navajo Nation. I have business people coming up to me and saying, Doc, we know your overhead is 60 to 70 percent. How are you keeping in business? This administration does not like small business. This administration understands that what was the workhorse of America is a small business person. They're building a government. Who's going to fund it? I understand those things. It's not about creating jobs right now. It's about saving jobs. And I don't know what kind of malarkey you guys believe in, but no one's taken into the trends of late, summer, or late spring, early summer, and the natural trends of employment in this country. And what's going to happen in the fourth quarter and the first quarter, of, fourth, fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year? It's that same tale. Because it's not permanent jobs, they're small jobs, they're intermittent jobs. Those are, these are not full-time jobs, folks. When they start laying off census workers. What's that? When they start laying off these census workers. In there you go. There you go. <laughs> and where did that stimulus money go? There. It was all, it was all government. Someone's going to so what we've got to do, and, and, and here's the next thing, and just, just so you know. I sold my practice last Tuesday to a kid from here in Flagstaff, and I'm proud of that. Because I brought somebody home that wanted to be home, and that's something that we have to do with family. Do you wonder why I know so much about banking? Did we get that bank loan for that kid here in this state? No. Do you think we were going to get it in this, in, this, in this state? No. Do you think we could have got it anywhere else in the country? Absolutely no. Guess how we got it? Through a benefit through the American Dental Association. What did Thomas Jefferson tell us about his biggest worry, and he argued incessantly about it, was government take over the banks. You darn right. And, and let me ask you about the charade with Goldman Sachs. Is anybody behind that charade? Let me, let me give you some information. Was Goldman Sachs ever offered less than a dollar for dollar buyout? No. How absurd. Was any other bank given the same thing? No. In fact, the SIP group, which was a small business bank, were they even allowed to offer shares? No. That's a shame. <coughs> shame. You know, we have to start looking at things from a historical viewpoint. And there's countless people that have said, if you're not a disciple and understand and look and review history, you become a product of history. It repeats itself. Here we go again. Tell me what was different between this era and Teddy Roosevelt. A central bank was Stanton. And many of the moves that happened during that time, most people credit for him putting off the Great Depression. We've got to come with some more innovation. So what do we got to do? Small business, business is what? Leveraging money, right? That's, that's what it is. So where's money going to come from? Private sector. How do we do it? Well, you have to cut taxes for one thing. You Good. Know, well, first we've got to start printing money. And you have to cut <laughs> regulations before people bought. can operate. You have to get out of their way and let them operate their business. You're exactly right. But we also got to do something else. You have to create wealth rather than consuming it. There you go. I like where you're going. You have to create wealth you know, through productivity and manufacturing and all that kind of thing. But what we got to do is, i got to get a buy-in to America. Let me ask you a couple things. How long ago did the old money in America go off the playing field? Well, not really. But yeah. They're still old money, and, but they left it five years ago. They've not been playing in the playing field. Why do they want to come back in? This administration is devaluing the dollar and their assets. Okay, Here's a free marketplace. When a bank gives me a loan, do they watch over me? Do they make me succeed? No. But if I give you money, I'm going to make sure I'm going to succeed. I say, hey, Gus, what are you doing? Tell me what's your, what your profit loss. Tell me how you're doing this. What's your, all those things. I get something that I can't buy from a bank. So I need a directional incentive. Small business and infrastructure. 
and I want America to invest in itself. And everything's on the plate. I said infrastructure. I mean roads, bridges, infrastructure. Let's step back in time. Remember when the, the, the bridge went down in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota? And they said, how many bridges in the country were usable? How many of those actually got done? Actually, 5%. Okay? My brother-in-law is one of the foremost engineers in the country for dams and bridges. Okay? Well, holy cow, we're running around on infrastructure that shouldn't even tolerate us. Boy, I think it'd be time to see what we could do you know, private sector-wise in an infrastructure act. I want to take that chance. I want to see what people can do. Because that's how we build. Tell me about our steel industry. It's non-existent. Okay? We got, we, got, we got construction people. We got everything here. We can put it to work. And small businesses, that's how we start getting it to work. Lean and me. Get it to go. And you know what's even better about that? Is District 1. How can we do this? Agriculture. Someone's going to say, you're hiring a kite. Oh, wait. Okay? Energy and resources. Let's talk about agriculture. What does District 1 have in agriculture? Everything. Citrus. We have all the fruits and vegetables. We've got cotton down the south. We've got pork. We've got chickens. We've got beef. We've got water. Holy cow, we've got a lot here. What about lumber? We've got lumber, too. But it's, it's locked up. Well, but those are things we've got to start looking at deregulating. We've got to start right. looking at this. But do you know that in 2008, in the Farm Bill, there was actually a passage that 16 states or entities could actually do their own food stamps? They had to do it for five years. Let me ask you a quick question. What is on the WIC diet, women, infants, and children, that everybody shouldn't be on? Maybe the fruit juices. Okay? I can take that. There is nothing. You, if, you're, if I'm asking you to tighten your belt, then the federal government should also tighten its belt. And the bureaucracy. Can you trade WIC dollars like you can uh, food stamps? Absolutely not. And guess what the number one class in schools are today? Cooking. Here's a sign. All of a sudden, we get to teach kids about what's good for you, how it should be, and how you get involved with your body. Personal accountability, personal responsibility, and they're dying to learn. Here's your sign. That's a good little avenue to start here. Boy, I thought first things first in Arizona was a great way to start. That's one right there. And we got the whole country to show it. Number two is energy. We're blessed. I'm, my energy ideas is that everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. But let's make it work for us. Okay? Because I also believe in alternative energy. I built my house. I'm the first guy out in Coconino County who took on the styrofoam blocks, by the way. You know what? If you look at my house, it looks like a regular log and rock house. It's very energy efficient. It stays very cool in the summer and very warm in the winter. So you don't know any different. We can teach construction, because I put myself through construction, through school with construction. I built big, long mansions, and in the times when things were bad in Wyoming, we did add-ons and energy efficiencies and all that kind of stuff. So we can work as best done on the community level. Solar may not be good somewhere else in the state. It's great here. Wind. All these things need to be there. Yeah, let's work. <laughs> Holy cow, today was way too much. <laughs> Like this is the first time I've ever had a gust when I was driving down to Camp Verde for a meeting. And I started in one lane and I ended up halfway in the other lane. <laughs> and I got a little scared. You know? yeah. And if you've been, ever been in Wyoming between Laramie and, and Cheyenne, mm, okay, it took some doing there. But, and you got another thing. It's called the Native Americans. I want to spend a little time right there with Native Americans. Something happened with Native Americans. They get the same benefits that you and I do. And this applies to health and to energy. But they also get another thing through the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So they get another tributary. In that aspect, they actually challenged the federal courts about self-determination. And the courts have held it. In the past, they had to do their contracts in health with Indian Health Services. Now they don't have to. They can actually take the money allotted to them by tribal numbers 
and do whatever they'd like to. Those are a few strings. But not like the rest of the strings, the rest of them. They could actually have the state-of-the-art hospitals, physicians from all over the world on Native American lands for for-profit. The only glitch we have is we have a little dilemma up here. And that's the Navajo Healthcare did do this. They didn't do it right. And we have a standing lawsuit coming from Flagstaff Medical Center. They can do it. And the same thing goes with energy. They're not under the same rules the rest of us are. But let me ask you a question. I've lived with Native Americans my whole life. In western Wyoming, it was the Shoshone. When I went to school, it was the Sioux. And now I have the Hopis and Navajos and the rest. Trust. Tell me what they've got to trust in the federal government. Do you know what trust is? Here's a great definition. A series of promises kept. Give me a promise that was kept. How sad. And yet the poorest of our healthcare could actually be our salvation, and actually the poorest of our segment could actually have the solutions to our energy. It's time to play. Here's a Republican that's already bridged that gap. I'm proud to say that. Because we've got to bring everybody to the table if we want, we want to save as this country. It's going to take a lot of hard work. I know about hard work. That's all I ever do. I don't know what vacations are. Because during my vacations, I see patients. There happen to be family. And many of you, I don't think, take vacations either. Next two years are going to be tough. And the two years after that, maybe even a little tougher. Because you're going to have to out a president. Yeah, I said it. <clears throat> I don't agree with this president. One I owe. I hope you don't either. Because he's shown me nothing in my beliefs, nothing in my beliefs that I had a chance to accomplish. I also think you're going to have to take on the regulatory body that's becoming its own set part of government. And I think you do that through Congress. Folks, I don't have all the ideas, but I will tell you, I am a fighter. And I like going down swinging. I don't like going down without taking my shots. It's going to take all of us. I need your help. I need your vote. I need your money. And I need your prayers. And I can look at each one of you and I say, I am the best candidate. And I want to kind of go through that real quickly. What other candidate makes Ann defend her own turf? Me. I've had three Democratic groups already come to talk to me. And you know why? I'm their doc. I mean, I like what i got to say, but I will listen to you, and I'm honest. I've never profited from anything, nor will I ever. That's what you get from me. But I'm all about how do we make and solve a problem. I've also raised more money than everybody, and I hope somebody asks me a question about that, because you deserve an answer. By two to three times. I can beat Ann. I believe I'm the only one. I am not an attorney. I am not a lobbyist. The number one reason why most people voted for Anna was that she was from here. I have lived here for 25 years. Dig up whatever you want on me. I don't really care. What you see is what you get. I think you'd be proud of what you get. Thank you very much. I really want your vote. I need your support. Um, Anthony's in the back. Um, still need signatures. We still we got plenty, but you always need more. Um, but I love questions, and I hope that you give me your questions. Thank you very much, folks. Questions? Yes. Um, who are you talking about government and such as that? Are you the kind of guy that would go to Washington and, and talk about? Reducing the size of government and laying off government workers that are non-essential and, and defunding the government to a certain extent. What I'm saying is there, by defunding, I mean defunding some of these programs such as health care and such as that. I think that's the answer to getting rid of this health care thing is defunding it. And I think it can be done, but it has to be somebody that's willing to go there and do it. And there's several projects. And also you talked about the interstate or the, the, the infrastructure in this country. And... The infrastructure 
is not going to get done from government. It's going to get done from the private sector. Right. So we need to get government out of the way and let them do their job. That's what we need to do with the infrastructure. And I'm wondering, are you willing to go to Congress and do that? First of all, I told you about the, the farm bill. I'm the guy who's been preaching it. Um, I believe that you know, if I'm asking you to buckle down, and by the way, dentistry is so darn frugal, let me give you a quick story. Last year at our annual session, we spent six hours arguing over a $1 dues increase. I mean, they fart pins. <laughs> so that's our nature. Okay? That starts, number one is, I've been a proponent of getting rid of food stamps and having one. What's, tell me, why do we have two? I don't get it. I'm a simpleton. I don't get it. Please eliminate one. Let's start with one. Let's do it right. And I believe that I'm a health care provider, that you better eat right and be right. And I do live it. I'm allergic to weed, so I, I'm a, I have to be very conscious of what I do. But I take ownership. You don't owe me anything. I watch what I eat. And I'm usually pretty good at separating myself out because I only usually have one chance at food, so I'm very good with a fork and knife. <laughs> That's good news. Appropriations goes through the house. And you're exactly right. We're going to go over that like a fine tooth comb. And I do believe that we're going to overtake that house and send Nancy out of the speaker's position. And I, hope I really like to see her lose her job, totally. I think that's kind of impossible. But I think that's where you're exactly right. That's how you start. But what it's going to take is I still don't think you're going to have the, the, the veto power, and I still think it's unclear what's going to happen in the Senate. So out of the House, you had better bring bills from the people to show exactly what this administration is going to do. I also think that you better take on the regulatory body. This is going to be one there's a line in the sand and you're going to have to take on it bad. Here's why. You regulate the whole West by what? EPA. That's who's coming. You better have your ducks in a row. You had better have them well in a row. Because guess they're coming. And if they control the water, they control everything. Well, pretty much. I like your idea. Because guess what? I like working with California. I want you to think outside the box here. Who's got the biggest economy outside the United States as a single state? California. Well, I want to play. Because if I got water, I can make my own compact. I want to see what the American ingenuity did, because I saw it at our dinner table. I saw it in Wyoming. Maybe we need what we have as a conservative aspect where we take people and we make sure that their water rights are upheld, but that we have an idea or a way that we look at the, the water that we have in excess, what do we do with it, and what do we do with the water when we don't have enough. And I'd like to use that commodity just like we've started. We bank water. How do we work with the farmers over in California? How do we work with the farmers down south? The, That's farm, the farmers are selling their water rights in California. They did it in the Owen Valley. They're doing it in the Palo Verde Valley now. That's where I was raised. And they've already sold off. They sold off the first time 25% of their water rights. And this time they leased another 15% just recently. They've, they've let go of almost 40% of their water rights. Why? To San Diego because San Diego is out of water. Then, but why? There's another part to this. What? For money. That's right. Because well, they're going out of business. Yeah. Well, they make more money doing that than they can. That's yeah, exactly money. right. So. But, but you know what? We've also taught farmers. You know, I went to school at Omaha, Nebraska. And we had this thing that we paid farmers not to put to till any ground. That's right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, like, first of all, folks, I don't get it. I know. I, I don't get it either because what are we going to eat? Well, once again, the greatest chance you have for a change is when there's greatest despair. Here's our sign. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I follow the Blue Comedy Tour pretty well, the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, but once again, here's, here's the things that are right in front of our eyes. Let's not play hard. I mean, we can play hardball, but let's not get complex. Let's keep it simple. And when you were talking about driving the economy, how about free money? If you're going to invest in, if you invest in America, how about capital gains free? Let's just keep it just really simple. Because guess what? Isn't that what happened with Reagan in the era? Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. And how did we come out of that one? Oh, hello. Real good. And Bill Clinton and Democrats. Yeah. But did that help? 
I'm not afraid to answer a question, and, and I'm not afraid to, to, to question anybody. I will tell you right now, I'll give you a quick example. The very first time I ever met Senator McCain, I challenged him in a photo shoot. He got flat out pissed off at me. <laughs> it was about that Indian health care bill that I was telling you about. Well, I'm glad you said that, because I've seen your name with his over there, and I was going to ask him one of question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, okay, well, let me, let me finish my story, and then we're going to go back to the second part, okay? So, I'm sitting on this bill. I actually, everybody was surprised I got put on this Council of Government Affairs because I represented seven states. And when you see me, I'll tell you how I feel. I don't care how you like it, you're going to get it. And I got put on this council. And I heard that the American Dental Association, Senator McCain, wouldn't talk to him. So I ended up at a, at a fundraiser for John Kyle. And they gave me this photo ticket. And I sat there and went, OK. And then the gal came in and said, all right, take your name tags off. Because you don't have one right now. Take it off. Make sure you're nice and good luck. And I went, <laughs> and I waited to the third and the last. And when we got in that between Kyle and, and John McCain, I started in. And she said, oh, you're a mess. And I started in. And I said, Senator McCain, I said, this Indian health care bill is an atrocity. Listen, let me tell you, people don't much want to live up there, much rather give health care up there. I said, excuse me, it's coming to Arizona. No, it's not, he said to me. I've got, we've got it walled off in Alaska. I said, funny thing. I have the minutes for the Intertribal Council, which you endorsed it. He goes, the hell I did. I said, yes, you did, sir. And he said, I suppose you're telling me I'm a liar, or something to that aspect. And I said, well, let me tell you. I thought you were a better historian than I was. That one man doesn't stop the federal government, nor the public health service. At that point, he turned red and was hopping. And he said, I suppose you have a better idea. And I said, yes, I do. I was whisked away after the photo. I sat around because I thought, oh, ooh. <laughs> he got an angry senator. After that meeting, he was milling around. I went up to him, and he knew me. He said, Paul, did I do that in your tribal council? I said, yes, you did, sir. I have it in my car. Anybody that knows me, I carry everything in my car. I had the minutes in the car. He said, no. He said, whatever happened, happened in the committee. Whatever happens on the House or Senate floor happens, and winked and smiled. Because come and see me. One thing I'll say about Senator McCain, he's always given me access to himself and to his staff. That's what I'll say. <laughs> it was about that Indian health care bill that I was telling you about. Well, I'm glad you said that, because I've seen your name with his over. I was going to ask him one this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, okay, well, let me, let me finish my story, and then we're going to go back to the second part, okay? So, I'm sitting on this bill. Actually, everybody was surprised I got put on this Council of Government Affairs because I represented seven states. And when you see me, I'll tell you how I feel. I don't care how you like it. You're going to get it. And I got put on this council. And I heard that the American Dental Association, Senator McCain, wouldn't talk to him. So I ended up at a, at a fundraiser for John Kyle. And they gave me this photo ticket. And I sat there and went, OK. And then the gal came in and said, all right, take your name tags off. Because you don't have one right now. Take it off. Make sure you're nice and good luck. And I went, <laughs> And I waited to the third and the last. And when we got in that between Kyle and, and John McCain, I started in. And she said, oh, you're a mess. And I started in on him. I said, Senator McCain, I said, this Indian health care bill is an atrocity. Listen, let me tell you, people don't much want to live up there, much rather give health care up there. I said, excuse me, it's coming to Arizona. No, it's not, he said to me. I've got, we've got it walled off in Alaska. I said, funny thing. I have the minutes for the Intertribal Council, which you endorsed it. He goes, the hell I did. I said, yes, you did, sir. And he said, I suppose you're telling me I'm a liar, or something to that aspect. And I said, well, let me tell you. I thought you were a better historian than I was. That one man doesn't stop the federal government, nor the public health service. At that point, he turned red and was hopping. And he said, I suppose you have a better idea. And I said, yes, I do. I was whisked away after the photo. I sat around because I thought, oh, ooh. <laughs> he got an angry senator. After that meeting, he was milling around. I went up to him, and he knew me. He said, Paul, did I do that in your tribal council? I said, yes, you did, sir. I have it in my car. Anybody that knows me, I carry everything in my car. I had the minutes in the car. He said, no. He said, whatever happened, happened in the committee. Whatever happens on the House or Senate floor happens. And winked and smiled because come and see me. One thing I'll say about Senator McCain, he's always given me access to himself and to his staff. 
That's when I'll say, don't agree much, but he's giving me access. But there was some magic in that because I learned what was happening behind the scenes and was able to push some of the things that I'm still pushing now on behalf of America. Now, why those signs are all up there? We happen to have the same PR people. And when they do signs, they do it all together. I'm a capitalist. I don't have lots of money. Senator McCain does. So when they go out there, I get a break. Okay? Does that help to answer? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not endorsing anybody. And I can tell you. I didn't, I didn't say you said that. I know. I just know. wondered if you were in favor of him. That's, that was my I, When I went back to D.C. recently, the press corner, they found out I was in town and they said, listen, who are you picking in that race? I said, you know what? There's a standing deal. Congressional candidates shouldn't be endorsing any other congressional candidates. Congressional delegation shouldn't either. And I said, you know what? To be honest with you, actually both of them pushed me in this race and supported me to get in this race. I said, it's for up to Arizona to decide. And I think that's the way it should be. Every single congressional delegation should wait until after the primary. Yes, sir. I had some question about why you want to get into this, but that's pretty much come out of a lot of your talk already. <laughs> but I want to know, what makes you think, as a junior <clears throat> congressman going in to the barrel of wolves that are right there, <laughs> that you're going to have any effect as a one man? How, what's your plan to try to build a consortium of like-minded men like yourself to start doing something about reading the bills they create? <laughs> you just made a remark about John McCain. Oh, it was in committee and got lost which immediately told me he didn't read what he was signing. And I think that's the problem with all of them there. They just sign things because they're under pressure. I want something from you, so you got to give me something. And how do you get away from all that wheeling and dealing and start thinking about what's important to the people you're, you're representing? You know, why, why so much believing in me and what's in it for me? Well, here's the first thing. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not lost in the shuffle. There will only be one dentist unless I'm elected and my good friend Lee Hawkins out of Georgia. And why is that important to you? Dentistry has always answered the table what's on best on behalf of the patients. They actually sponsor the Patient Bill of Rights, the advocation of, of red flags rule for small businesses. You can go on and on and on. And the thing that is, there's going to be still less than 20 physicians and dentists in the whole thing, in the whole group gives me standing. Number two is they've already seen me. Some of these people that will still be left behind have already seen me, and I've said shame on you. Some of them I've applauded. Because I think you come with ideas, and that's number one. But I think the standing is, number, is, is the best part. They've actually seen somebody that said, you know what, found out about this bell called McCarran Ferguson. In fact, the American Dental Association didn't even want to do it. I actually went to Peter DeFazio, who I actually heard his friend, Gene Taylor, Congressman Gene Taylor out of Mississippi, on the Lou Dobbs show, talk about this bill. And I went before my meeting to go see him. I found out all about the bill. I actually let all the staff of the American Dental Association hang themselves. Because I asked about, is there any other bills we should be aware of? Once again, I'm not soft spoken. And when they found out this bill, that is near and dear to all dentists' heart, and has been at, no one's been talking about it, there we have it. Then I was also told we couldn't do this. Me and friends actually dialogued with the American Bar Association. Amazing how they stayed out of the fray in the House. You know, I don't like D.C. I'll be really frank with you. I don't intend to ever live back there. I'll live in my office. I'll live in the quarters with a bunch of other people. But my home is here. I've always loved getting on my tractor. I love peace and quiet. I have never found it. But I know I ain't going to find it there. I don't sleep when I go back there. I haven't slept when I've gone back from my meetings for the last four years, four times a year. I could look my mom in my eye, in her eye, and say, hey, I was elected and I did make a difference. And I'll also tell you something else. I think there's going to be a big change coming. That house is going to change complexity very, very, very greatly. And I think the people that have been on the ground who understand this from the nuts and bolts, from the business side, and who knows business better than Dennis? I, I think I'm actually second fiddle to a number of dentists around. It's unbelievable the resources dentists come up with and understand. They're incredible businessmen. And do you realize the least I pay one of my employees is $17 an hour, or I did. I have employees making over 40. So 
So, I don't know. I, I, that's the best I can tell you. I know I'll get some standing as a dentist because John Linder, who you ought to be thinking about because he was the fair tax guy, one of the fair tax guys, is retired. John Linder has been mentoring me and helping me out. The only one will be left is Mike Simpson if he wins his re-election out of Idaho. And like I told you, the only other one that's running is Lee Hawkins and Nathan Deal see, that he advocated. So he's in a two-way, and that's coming up next week or the week after. I'm you. I, I don't want to hand this down. I'm the product of proud immigrants. And what they did is they came here the right way. They engraved. They embraced America. And I love it. Money has never been anything for me. I'm not a rich guy. That's why I had to in practice. But that I'm proud about that. There's something you can't buy from me. It's not for sale. Roger. Uh, what's your ideas about reasonable term limits or progression from Congress to Senate to President? In me. <laughs> Folks, you know, term limits, our forefathers thought this out. We, we're all guilty. And I look at every single one of you. You didn't go to the voting booth right. You didn't demand stuff of people. You say, hey, why? Where were you? How do you feel? How come you didn't do the same thing we did? Why is your health care different than our health care? We've been doing this slowly but surely over time. And it's your job. It's our job to do that. I personally, if I'm not making a difference, I'm coming home. i got better things to do with my life. I told you, I love building things. I love playing on a tractor. I got my kids, and I missed out on a lot. So I'll, I'm not staying back there for a lifetime. There's too many other things to do that are enjoyable. But we're going to have to have people start anding up to make sure that we have that light at the end of the tunnel. We'll start talking to high school kids, see if they see that light at the end of the tunnel. You know what? A good person I want to touch base with is, is um, Senator Coburn. He was a representative, he went, went home as an OBGYN. And guess what? They said, you know what? You did such a darn good job, we want you back as senator. That's kind of a neat little story. He's a good man. He's a good man. I know Senator Cole. And I think that's the right way. I, I, but I think, you know what? Don't let your guard down. Don't. And if I'm elected and someone's not... He's a good man. He's a good man. I know Senator Coley, and I think that's the right way. I, I, but I think, you know what? Don't let your guard down. Don't. And if I'm elected and someone's not, and I'm not listening to you, hit me with a two by four. I deserve it. And I'll applaud you for it. Go Sars, got thick skulls. It ain't gonna hurt me. But you know what? That's our due diligence. And if I'm elected, what I want to see us do is, is Make a difference for this whole district. Oh, and by the way, that's another thing. Thank you, Roger, for bringing that up to me. This is a magical time, it's 2010. Do you know why? This census. You're going to get at least one congressional district, probably two new congressional districts out of this district, and some of the others. The first one, if you look at this big old monstrosity of a district, is the bottom. Pinal County is probably going to go away with all its growth. Go look at who's down there. You got some superstars down there. Whoa! And then I think you're going to get a second one. Whether that be the East Valley or the West Valley, I don't know. If you get a three for one or at least a two for one change, that's magic for 2012. There ain't too many other states are going to be able to say that, folks. So you got a gift. Don't ever let that gift get away from you. More questions? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Couldn't see you. I haven't called, sir, before. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at this guy right here, so I couldn't tell someone. Right. Sorry. Well, was I asleep, or did you mention immigration? I haven't talked about immigration. I was hoping you're asking. <laughs> what do you want to ask me? I want to know um, what you think of the bill. 1070? Mm -hmm. Tell me what part is not mirroring the Constitution and what's already in federal statute. Please tell me. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another question. I'm going to pose it in a different manner. Please tell me why the judiciary branch hasn't really enacted anything. You know why? They can't. They absolutely can't. And what's better is there's something else going on. It's called the birthright. Um, I always get it wrong. It's, it's House Bill 1868. It actually closes a loophole in birth babies. 
you must, both parents must be um, citizens of the United States before that baby can actually become a citizen of the United States. <laughs> Sponsored by Nathan Deal. There are 90 co-sponsors right now. The only one I believe from Arizona is John Shad. Guess what? Time to make your mark. Start ringing calls. And I mean, not just here in Arizona. Let's start calling everywhere. And if it's so wrong, tell me why the numbers. Please tell me what the numbers. Here's the next part. What was, what was the bill number? 1868, Birthright Citizenship Act. The Senate? House. House. Okay? Here's the next part of that. There's another problem that no one will address. And it's a country of Mexico. This is a two-part deal. And they better ante up. This is a win-win solution here. But why do you have, why have you had over 50 in, in, intrusions into sovereign U.S. soil by the uh, Mexican military? And it's documented. It's right there in the FBI files. Excuse me, what the hell's going on here? What did I tell you at the very beginning? I believe in personal accountability and personal responsibility. I have learned more from my failures than I have done from my successes. It's time to pony up. Let me give you a story about my grandfather, a French Basque guy. The other side of me is French Basque, by the way. So I guess I'm a terrorist on both sides. <laughs> okay. Fought in World War I in trench warfare. His, his trench was overrun. Somehow he got behind enemy lines and the Yanks were going through. <laughs> my uncle, my grandfather said, hmm, we're fighting on the same side, so he fought with the Yanks. When they went on furlough, guess who came over across the United States? <laughs> my grandfather. He already had family somewhere in Montpelier, Idaho. He hitchhiked all the way across. The sergeant heard that he was wanted for desertion. In the, French, uh, in the French country. So we're back across, the hitchhiked it across, and they cleared his name. Came through Ellis Island, did it right, went back and got my grandmother. My grandmother was the head cook for the French Marquis at the age of 14. He went to the priest and said, hey, can't find any ladies that want to marry me in America. He said, come to church, go up the street, do a bow on the, on the door, knock on the door, and that's your wife. That was my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather went to English to third grade to learn English at the age of 33. He told my family, the rest of my, my uncles and aunts and my grandmother, this is our country. We learn the language and this is part of us. We can have our heritage, but this is our country. And you can't print everything in every, every single language. You can't. English is our language. I got something else for you. We're all from Flagstaff. Tell me how we came to that vote, unanimous vote by a city council yeah. against this bill. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I don't live in this. I don't live in town. I'm actually in Doney Park. Yeah. Sounds to me like it's time for a recall once we get an election. Yeah. You think? Yeah. Should have been the affordable housing form when this is built. Oh. <laughs> well, the nickname around District One is this is Berkeley East. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, we're $6 million in debt if you're talking about how to give more city funds to this affordable housing. But once again, what did you say earlier on? Appropriations. We go hard. We go, we go strong. Yes, Joy. You know, um, a huge problem in the country today that's becoming more and more apparent is that we've got uh, an administration back there that's anti-American. And we've got a school system that is gradually getting that way. I I'm sure a lot of uh, everyone in the room heard Hannity the other night. There was a young seventh grader who, in an art class, drew a picture of the American flag and, and said, God bless America. And her teacher came up to her and said that that, that was an insult. <laughs> and another child in the class drew a picture of Obama, and the teacher said, thank you for supporting your country. This, to me, this is outrageous. This is outrageous. And this is only one example. Well, there's um, that other one where the kids wear the shirts. Oh, yes. oh yeah. 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 Oh, I've got to tell you something. Uh, I've already had one go through uh, the school system here. I can actually tell you stories with my daughter, Ellie. It doesn't, you don't have to go anywhere else but Flagstaff. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to your question, appropriations. So this really gets at the, at the nuts and bolts about it. Are you going to vote for Proposition 100? Me? Yeah. 100? Yeah. To pass the tax? Yeah. 
No, I don't think so. I'm going to vote for Proposition 13 to freeze the property tax yeah. so we can keep it. Good. Yeah. Here's the deal. You still, in, in Proposition 100, you still have a one administrator for teacher ratio. I don't get it. No, I don't. I, I really, and as a businessman, any businessman, do you get that? No. no. I don't get it. So we haven't cut enough. Here's the second bad part of Proposition 1. Tell me the money's actually going to go there. How many bonds have we passed in Flagstaff where the money didn't go where it won? You know, hit me once, got to learn, hit me twice. You know, I hope you don't hit me a third time. Come on, folks. The second part, Joy, I think is very important. And I want to do it by a story. I'm from P Pinedale Public High School in Pinedale, Wyoming. Down at the time of 900 and some odd people. Okay? By my beginning of my junior year, I had no more math and science I could take. What ended up happening is we had some independent study. I actually got to work with the Game and Fish, by the way. The people in the town started becoming part of the teaching corps, which is high time. How many things do you know out there that haven't been passed on? I'll give you another quick thing. I'm a parent, too. I can say things to my kids, and it goes in one ear and out the other. It's tricky. I still haven't talked to it, so you've got to keep it down when you talk to my kids. I actually import my parents in to tell my kids what they told me. And guess what? It's deja vu. Guess what grandma and grandpa told me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, whoa. But you know what? That's what has to happen. And that's a thing that I normally put in my thing. It's called mentoring. All our freedoms and liberties aren't handed down. I mean, they're not given in bloodlines. We can lose in one generation. Well, we're going fast on that one, aren't we? Yeah, we are. And this election is going to mean that we mentor kids to show them that we, what is at the light of the tunnel? What's in it for them? Not much. They don't change their ways. Oh, yeah. But you know what? They're there. And I can tell you, I took, that, I took the Constitution. You know Gaston. I threw it on, the, on my counter. I have, I'm a kid. I think I named him Sue. <laughs> He's named after my brother. And my mom said, hey, I wish one of you on yourself. Somehow I got my brother. But I put that on the countertop. And Gaston came in from Brandy's. <clears throat> Next day was Saturday. Didn't have to work. He was on our couch like this. <laughs> you know, when kids go in the inverted style of the book, it means they're involved in the book. Gaston has found this book very enjoyable. And guess what he said? I never found out about this in school. Yeah. Guess what? Here's your son. Do I need to say anymore? But that's that's things that you have the capability of influencing. Do not ever give it up. You earn those stripes, you earn those gray hairs, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents don't ever give that up. Please. That's what made this country unbelievable. That's the problem with the school system today. Too many people are using it for babysitters instead of teaching their kids what they know. Okay, let me, I'll give you the next thing. Who has the highest achievement per capita of any nation? Sweden. Sweden. They don't start school until the age of seven. So I'm just going to tell you, it's, don't, don't tell me we need preschool. Don't tell me we need a K. There's a lots in books, but you know what? There's so much, and there's so many kids that look at, at the expertise that's just around you, Sure. Yes, Joy. Well, did you know, this is small compared to all the other stuff, but it's just one more thing. You know the health care bill so well. I just recently found out through our Outdoor Trade Association that in that health care bill, it is now a requirement, unless we can get it repeated. Over $500? The, six, the 1099. Yes. Now, every business has to send a 1099 yep. to any anybody that they spend more than $600 a year in. I asked my bookkeeper, I said, well, how many 1099s did we send last year? She said, about eight I hand wrote them. I said, how many new bills? It doesn't get repealed. How many would we have to write? 89. 
Now that that is 89. That means we have to give a 1099 to Walmart, Sam's Club, mm -hmm. our electrician, our welder, the gas station, the grocery <coughs> store. It's unreal. <coughs> it's unreal. It's big brother at its, at its best. And when you can at its worst, but you know the. <coughs> the way I look at it is, it's not, whatever happened to the Paperwork Reduction Act, number one. Also, the amount, the, the amount of time and the expense involved in something this stupid for a small business. I really find that it's hard for me to do more in my business these days because I'm so tied up in the red tape. And we're not big enough to pay other people, other than we have a CPA, but, but you know, you can't give everything to a $200 an hour CPA. So, I found this amazing. I bet nobody knew that this was in the book. It's and been, it's, Joy, has been going like wildfire through the dentist caught it. But here's something even worse than I hope none of you have a cardiac arrest yet. Mm -hmm. Do you know this bill is subject to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and their interpretation of law over 1,700 times in the bill? So what you think it is, ain't. Mm -hmm. And what you thought about, aren't. That probably, that's not good English, but that's what the thing is, is now it's subjective to the government mm -hmm. and their interpretation. This wants to take over the... Well, the this was not about health care. It was about one-sixth of the GMP. That's exactly what it was all about. Which was about taking control of your... That's exactly right. Your and, 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 and i got to tell you, you know, the whole process started. My grandfather carried a little, and I wish I had it. It's in my car. But my grandfather always carried it in his pocket. And it's called the socialization of medicine. And it's a frog. When a frog you throw it in hot water, it jumps completely out. Mm -hmm. It knows it's mm -hmm. what's wrong. Yeah. But when you put it in cold water and slowly turn up the heat, it boils. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did, folks. Mm -hmm. from, from the Medicaid Act, from Medicare, to this bill, to all the thin little infringements that we've been having. Mm -hmm. So here we go. And if you don't think, and, I, and once again, I'm going to bring it up. You don't think the Supreme Court nomination is insidious? She's personal friends with the, with the president. She's she has no election. paper trail. She's tied in with Goldman Sachs. That's right. She has no paper trail. And look at the little coercion or the little group that she worked with. Harvard Law. I mean, it, hey, folks, this is endless. But you know what? I'll always comment when somebody makes an incredible move. Because if I can acknowledge it, I can now think it. It just takes all of us to do that. These bills have to be simplified. Back to Edgy Joy. We have to know the pros and cons. We have to have all vision. Anything that changes got to go another minimum of 72 hours for the American people by the time it's online. And it doesn't start at midnight. We have, have to have all the eyes because you can't. One of those people I was talking to you about, I said, how in the hell did this happen? because you have no idea the pressure you're put on us. He goes, there's a new bill flopped on our door every morning. We can't keep up. Who's believing the CBO, by the way? <laughs> Who's believing the, 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 the attorneys for the House? They're supposed to be non-partisan. But the CBO can only work with what information is given to There them. you go. They can. Business has always been said that a board of, of, of directors is only as good as the information given. And how many times have we had CEOs and, and staff that never gave them the, the information to make those decisions? That's what they did with the health care bureau. That's they exactly the information right. They wanted them to well, have. okay, so here's the next question you ought to ask the senator. Where were you when this bill was coming up when it was just being written? These are all questions that need to be asked, not just here. It wasn't, you were debating a bill that wasn't even written. written. Yeah. Still isn't. No, oh, still not. No. It's still a gray area. And another bureaucracy. That's the other thing. Once again, I told you about We have to start looking at the fourth arm that was never intended, the regulatory board, or the regulatory arm that government's now built. How do you take them on? They're going around the government. They're going around the Senate and Congress now with a lot of this stuff. Oh, that's exactly right. You know, but you know, J.D. Hayward comes up with a great idea. So I'm not stealing it. i, I got to tell you. His idea is to make all um, regulatory uh, law come back through the House, like you said, for an up or down vote. That way you at least have some accountability. Mm -hmm. It's simple. I like it. Where's McCain stand on that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I'd ask him. And, and you know what? That's the other thing I'd do. It's a magical time. You got me up here. I hope you get the rest of the CD1. I mean, Perry's back there. Rusty is around. 
Brad's around, you make those decisions. But you ought to hear and see everybody. And I hope that you hold everybody accountable. Touch them, make sure they're around. You know about the CCX? The car, Chicago Carbon Exchange? No. You were talking about Goldman Sachs being, yeah. being uh, uh, you know, put upon by the government. Goldman Sachs is involved in the car, car, Chicago Carbon mm -hmm. Exchange, mm -hmm. along with the head of that car, Chicago Carbon Exchange is your president, Barack Obama. Oh, that's exactly right. Also, Al Gore is involved in it. Al Gore has a big chunk of money in it. There's a, there's a professor at uh, Harvard that says this carbon Chicago exchange is worth $10 trillion. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the taxes are going to bring in. And they're going around the Congress. The Joyce Foundation is funding this carbon uh, Chicago carbon exchange <laughs> so they can go around the Congress and put a tax on you. They can, they can invoke all these green uh, laws that they want through that Chicago Carbon Exchange and, and, and impose the taxes on you, and there's nothing the Congress can do about it. You brought up two good points. Yes, and it's multinational. Yeah. Because Al Gore owns property in Brazil, and he's got the credit for it. Number two is, you said the next thing, the foundations. Most of these foundations, you better go back and look at them. Oh, I have had personal aspects with the Kellogg and the Rasmussen Foundation. Who's What's so important about the Kellogg Foundation? You always hear them with the Native Americans. Who pushed the health care bill, by the way? Kellogg Foundation. Rasmussen Foundation. A series of promises kept. It's even worse. Guess who does the MBA program for the dentists to the American Dental Association? Kellogg Foundation. <laughs> Got the teeth everywhere. Foundations did more movement of that bill than anybody. So you better start looking at where you send your money to these foundations because these nonprofits have maneuvered themselves around where they have manipulated policy, both regulatory and congressional, state and local. Eyes open, folks. Eyes open. So, yes, ma'am. Actually, um, I was hoping maybe you could clarify something for me. You sure. mentioned uh, a birthright bill regarding American citizenship. Yep. I haven't heard that, but I've heard that concept before. And I'm assuming the bill states that you have to have both your parents are American citizens before you're an American citizen. Knowing what I know from experience and just seeing how we don't enforce our immigration laws currently, and we, you know, we make these tougher laws because it makes us feel good, my concern with something like that might be if people come in here legally, they have a child, now that child is illegal, it's not an American citizen, they grow up here, do, are their children citizens or their children's children? And at what point do, are we just creating a subgroup of people who will never be citizens and be outside of our American society, but yet and we, you know, we make these tougher laws because it makes us feel good. My concern with something like that might be if people come in here legally, they have a child, now that child is illegal, it's not an American citizen, they grow up here. Do, are their children citizens or their children's children? And at what point do, are we just creating a subgroup of people who will never be citizens and be outside of our American society, but yet living with us? Problem in the 14th Amendment, parts of this were already taken on our backtrack a little bit. People that are attaches and um, uh, ambassadors from other countries that have a baby here do not have citizenship of that baby. That's already part of the law. Okay? There's no way when you talk about law to go retrofitting it. You have to start from the day of that. That's a problem with the judiciary. You've got to start somewhere. There's some line in the sand that you've got to start. And this, this immigration, do I have all those answers? Absolutely no. But you're also talking to somebody who is, my grandparents were both immigrants. One were butchers, one were ranchers. And I, and I gotta tell you, I butchered more animals than I actually herded. In fact, I've carried more saddles out of the mountain than I've been carried on. But the point was, was there's a start point. And you can't just keep saying, we, there's, there's exceptions to the rule, exceptions to the rule, exceptions to the rule, without starting somewhere. Secure the border. I don't want a closed border, I want commerce. There's a difference. Secure the border? Yes. Why are we getting this influx? Because what do they do on the both sides? Texas is pretty secure. So is California. Guess where the funnel's coming? Guess who's, yes, exactly right. Who's got the major I mean, pipeline? You've got interstates. You find everything in, in the confluences of interstates. I mean, I found my wife's an antique dealer. I found things here that you never believe you'd ever see here. Why? The confluences of two. Two interstates. You've got to secure that border. 
That's number one. Number two is you've got to start looking at the birthright law so that you don't keep having this problem. And you know what? Businesses are part of the problem. Do you know what's on the billboards on, in El Paso? OBGYNs that are saying, come have your babies in America. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Okay? We're just making it worse. So start somewhere. Is, is it perfect? No, it's not. But does it follow, I think, the true intentions of the 14th Amendment? I do. It starts. Then we can decipher all the rest of it. But, it, I mean, if, if just the start of enforcing laws did what it did, I mean, who saw the Arizona Republic of a lady that's an, you know, an illegal immigrant that says, i got to leave now? Just by enforcing the laws? Can we start there? And can then we work back, backwards? Outcomes based? Let's start with things that do work and start building on those things. And I think this is a, the point. I, I've said this all along. When I found out about it, I went just like, yes. Because that's part of the problem. Because when you have that baby, I have the right to come in here. You also have, there's another part to this. It gets even worse, folks. Okay? So we actually have people marrying terrorists getting citizenship, and doing this over and over again. And they still get money, and you're funding terrorism. There's a lady in Lebanon who's married now 20-some times, if I'm not mistaken. Where does that stop? So there's always exceptions. There's no airtight law, okay? But there's got to be something. It starts with defining, securing the border, and enforcing laws. How about we start there first, and let's see what happens? And you know what? I've got to tell you something about looking for a license. I'm getting my triennial license for my dental degree, for my dental license. I have to prove I am a citizen of this country. I, folks, I'm not kidding you. I am not kidding you. So, you're going to be racial to me? I'm not Spanish fast, but I'm French fast. You know? I'm Slovenian, so maybe they're the two. But the other thing that you need to bring up here is, is what you do on your southern border, Please do on your northern border and do on your ports. You don't even control your ports. How many jobs are right there? My understanding is Dubai owns a bunch of it. So, so why don't you have a policy that encapsulates a whole big start? Start simple. And that's what I was saying about health care. Same thing. Start simple. Let's get competition between the insurance company. We've had a stagnant marketplace and... It, and, and um, for free market enterprise for 50 years. I'd like to start there. Number two is, I want to hold public health accountable at the local level. How come Buffalo, Wyoming has population 4,000, has 15 family docks, and you don't got that here in a population of 70,000? You have no idea. I'm going to ask you another question. I'm a, I, I think North Country's fine. Are they honoring their contracts? They were brought here to see the underserved and those without insurance got a project for you, every single one of you to hold on feet to the fire. Make a phone call and tell them you're on access. Tell them that you're an adult with a toothache and see when you get that appointment. Turn around and go to your neighbor's house and make the same phone call and say, I got cash or insurance and see if those two days jive. <coughs> Why don't we start going back over to North Country and to our emergency room at the hospital and see how many people go back and forth, 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 back and forth. That's called scamming America. I'm one American damn ass tired of seeing that same kind of crap. It's happens by private, private people, but it's also the government. And it's public health. Here's the third thing. And I'm glad we don't have it right now because it gives you an, an arsenal to take on. And that's tort reform. I'm glad we don't have it right now. Do you know why? Because you can actually take them to court. If you had tort reform, you couldn't even take them to court. And I'm a dentist telling you that. And I'm the guy that told the American Dental Association, be careful what you ask for. Tort reform might just save your butt. Tell me one more question. Tell me the profession still standing. Trial lawyers. Well, attorneys, law. Are the engineers still standing? Yeah. They're not many. Guess how the dentists talk to the attorneys. Are you think that you're going to be the last one standing? Think again. Your profession is just as good as gold gone when the rest of us are gone. 
And that's why they wanted to play. That's why they kept quiet. <clears throat> Sometimes it's how you phrase things. Sometimes it's got skin in the game. I got lots of skin in this game. I got three kids. By damn, if I'm going to be the first in my lineage to ever say that I didn't give a try. But wake up, folks. As you elect me, I'm coming knocking. This isn't a job for one person. And our far, far, forefathers knew that. You have a right to any up. If you have an idea, who is it? Who are you not to share your light that empowers everybody else? Your light enumerates and sets people free. Go back to that passage. <clears throat> Nelson Mandela. It's one of my favorite passages. Your light shines on others and frees them to shine their light. Who are you to let your line not shine, your light not shine? I want the rest of it to seem incredible. Time to shine, folks. You took the time to come and see some hit from the sticks, some grunt. I live and breathe and die it. I love this district. I ain't going anywhere. But it's worth fighting for. What did I tell you my name was? Fight and go, sir. I'm proud to be a fight and go, sir. Damn, that's proud. You have a question? Thank you, folks. I certainly appreciated myself. I mean, i got to tell you, I enjoyed myself probably more than you do. <laughs> that's why in my dental practice, that's why I'm not rich. Because my appointments, as Jamie and Glenn will tell you, if a normal procedure is an hour, I'd give two. Because I do give you freedom of speech after. Yes. Okay, bye, so. Thank you, folks. Um, my number is here, my cell phone is, and I do answer my cell phone. So please give me a call. I need your help. I need your vote. If you believe, let's do it together. Thank you.